Hello and what's up peeps, this is the Geek Artist back again with another video and on this week's tutorial we are going back to the basics to study the art fundamentals of realistic rendering of objects with light and shadow. In this video we will learn how to go from this simple flat circle to a realistically rendered three-dimensional sphere under direct sunlight and then under a softer diffuse overcast lighting and also learn the science of realistic lighting and how light operates and reacts on a surface and its various effects. This firm understanding of light will enable you to easily tackle more complex subjects, forms and shapes of objects. So don't miss out on any of these and make sure to watch this video till the end. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe and click on the bell icon. So we will start off with a simple flat circle that will resemble a sphere which is kept in contact with a line which should resemble a plane surface. When light strikes a geometric solid such as a sphere, it creates a series of tones. Learning to identify these tones and placing them in their proper relationship is one of the keys to achieving a look of realism and solidity. So as we can see when a strong directional light such as sunlight reaches an object such as a sphere, it creates two primary sides. The light side or the side exposed to direct light and the shadow side or the side that is cut off from the direct light. And due to this absence of direct light, we get an extension of the shadow side known as the cast shadow. The area where the light side transitions to the shadow side is called the terminator and is located precisely where the light rays are tangent to the object's surface. Now if we were to take a slightly angular look at the same diagram in a 3D plane, our brain primarily recognizes three major graphical elements to understand form, the shape of the light side and shadow side of the object and the shape of its cast shadow. And then the brain starts processing further minute details and tonal variations, which we are going to learn about next. Now with a basic understanding of form, let's start the rendering process. Now as a reference guide, I'll be keeping the two previous diagrams open on the top right corner. So now we have a flat circle shape and we'll try to paint in the three major graphical elements, light side, shadow side and cast shadow. And we'll start with the shadow side. I'm keeping the light ray arrows on for reference for the tangent on the sphere surface where the terminator will be located. Now I've taken a new clipping mask layer and with the large soft round brush set at around 12% opacity, I'm painting the shadow side with a dark gray color I picked from the corner diagram shadow. Once I have a soft tonal transition from light side to the dark side, I'll start painting a slightly sharper and darker line in the middle to create the terminator from one tangential point to the other. Now we have a clear distinctive division between the light and the shadow side. Now I'm painting some soft darker tones on the light side near the terminator to create some half tones. The half tones will originate from right beyond the terminator, start as a dark half tone, then fade out to light half tones and gradually transition to the highlight area. Now that we have the first two major graphical elements, it's time for the third, the cast shadow. To create that, I'll be duplicating the main circle shape, set it to a multiply blending mode, transform it down to a narrow oval shape and adjust it so that the two horizontal tips meet where the first two rays of the light meet the surface to get an accurate length of the shadow. Then with levels adjustment, I'll make it darker to match the value of the shadow side of the sphere. And finally, I'll select the right half of the cast shadow and add some motion blur to the tipping point edge to add some realism. I can turn the light rays off now. So now that we have all three major graphical elements down, we can start adding the other secondary informations. So I'll take a new layer, add some dark halftones and then start painting the highlights with a very low opacity soft round brush. Next I'll come to the cast shadow area and with a much darker grey, I'll paint the occlusion shadow within the cast shadow area, specifically near the contact point between the sphere and the ground. It's the darkest area where least amount of light reaches. Now I'm erasing the edge of the cast shadow a little to make it fade out so that there's a nice transition from the dark occlusion to a lighter cast shadow 
as a result of scattered fill light from the environment. What we'll draw next is bounce light or reflected light. First, I'll paint some bright highlights on the ground plane just ahead of the sphere to show the intensity of the direct light hitting the ground surface. Next, I'll come to the sphere, take a new layer, pick the highlight color and gently paint a soft light in the lower shadow area, which is the reflected light bounced back up from the ground plane. Then lower the opacity of the layer just slightly. Then I'll paint some very soft light wrap along the edges of the shadow side, which is a result of environmental global illumination and then I'll erase some of the reflected light near the occlusion region from the bottom. Very, very subtle. Finally, coming back to the light side, it's time to paint the reflected highlight, which is relative to the viewing angle and will vary with you as you or the camera changes position. So it can be anywhere in the light side, depending on your position. Now this reflected highlight can tell a lot about the material of the sphere. A blurry highlight will indicate a rougher matte material and a sharper highlight will indicate a shinier and more reflective material such as painted steel or chrome. So let's tally this up with our initial light diagram. This is the light side, this is the dark side, between them we have the terminator just beyond which we have the core of the shadow where weaker secondary lights have the minimum impact on and it is generally the darkest part of the shadow side. Then we have the reflected light bounce right back up from the ground surface. Then the environmental light wrap, the cast shadow, which fades out as it moves further away from the sphere, since the scattered lights in the environment start affecting it. Then we have the darkest region called the occlusion shadow, with minimum light reaching it. And finally, we have the primary lights, the passive light, and reflected light. The passive or central light is the most brightly lit area of the surface which occurs when the light rays are most perpendicular to it. Even when a camera or a viewer moves around the object, the passive highlight stays exactly in the same position relative to the light source. Unlike the reflective highlight which is the reflection of the light source and it moves whenever the camera or the viewer changes position. So to summarize all that, under a direct lighting condition, there's a strong division of light and shade. The light side includes the light, the dark halftones, the center light or the passive highlight, and the reflective highlight. The shadow side includes not just darkness but the effects of the weaker sources such as reflected light bounced back up from the surface, a globally illuminated wrap along the edges, and finally the core of the shadow and the darkest part at the area of contact called the occlusion shadow, which then leads on to the cast shadow. Now under a different lighting setup, such as a soft or diffuse light, like an overcast sky, things would be a little different. There will be no distinct light side, shadow side, terminator, shadow core, or cast shadow. In such a condition, there is no strong singular directional light. Rather, the entire sky from the east to the west and from the north to the south acts as a large blanket of uniform light source. Light comes in from all directions from above and scatters in every possible direction, diffusing the overall strength of the light, making its effect much softer and weaker. So the tonal variations will be much softer, the transition from light side to dark side will be much more gradual, and as you can see, I'm using a large soft round brush with a very low opacity to paint it. Even the passive and reflective highlights will be very soft and subtle, like on a matte surface. Light hitting the ground plane won't be strong enough to be reflected back up to the lower shadow region of the sphere. Finally, there won't be any distinct cast shadow with sharp edges. It's mainly going to be a very blurry and soft occlusion shadow, which will gradually be dimmed down as more scattered light will affect it from all around. So here's a quick comparison of the rendered spheres under two different lighting setups. I hope you found this video useful and if you did, don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon to get notifications about my upcoming videos. So that's it for now, see you on the next one, peace.